Our next speaker is uh, one of our SAT trustees, Julia Cleave, and she is going to be presenting evidence for Shakespeare playing on court insider gossip in three of his comedies. Ladies and gentlemen, Julia Cleave. Saying hello to everyone and I'm going to disappear and share my screen. Right, and as this is going to be essentially a, a slideshow, I recommend to everyone that they go for a full screen if you can and eliminate any uh, top or side um, video uh, cameos. So, Shakespeare, in daring to present Elizabeth in the guise of a Titania, a Portia and Olivia, makes sport with a colourful cast of the Queen's actual suitors. English, French, Spanish, German, and Swedish. The quote comes from Twelfth Night, Sir Toby's gleeful a response to Mariah's cunning plan to expose Malvolio. Excellent, I smell a device. But first I should acknowledge a debt that I am building on the work of pioneer scholars in this field, such as Ava Turner Clark in her book, Hidden Illusions in Shakespeare's Plays, and those who have followed in her footsteps. But I'm also introducing original research of my own. When she came to the throne in 1558, Elizabeth was considered the best marriage in the parish. And for the first half of her reign, a score of men paid court to her. Foreign kings, princes, dukes, and native earls and knights. Keeping them in play or at bay was all part of the serious game of high politics. I will be focusing on seven of these would-be suitors highlighted in red. Archduke Charles, son of the Holy Roman Emperor, King Eric of Sweden, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, the Count Palatine, John Casimir, the French Prince, Francis, Duke of Alençon, Sir Christopher Hatton, and Don John, bastard half-brother of King Philip of Spain. And Don John is the joker in this pack. The most prolonged of all the Queen's formal courtships was with the Valois Prince, Francois. As heir to the French throne, he was known throughout Europe as Monsieur. To the English, he was simply Francis. To Elizabeth, in her many love letters, he was her très cher Monsieur. All I do is dream. Hence, bizarrely, Bottom addressing the fairies, no fewer than 11 times as Monsieur. Piquant details of their on-off affair are referenced in every scene of A Midsummer Night's Dream. I will come to one particular episode in a moment. Francis was her frog, on whom on occasion she doted. This was a mystery to the court, given that he was stunted in stature and spotted with pockholes. It was rumoured she must be the victim of a love potion. In fact, it was Lester who spread that rumour. My mistress with a monster is in love. Francis makes a second appearance in The Merchant of Venice among Portia's suitors. What think you of the French Lord, Monsieur Le Bon? God made him and therefore let him pass for a man. He is every man in no man. If a throstle sing, he falls straight a capering. Editors of the two plays note that Bottom is also associated with the singing of a throstle, but they don't get the joke. Translate throstle into French and you get Mauvi, the name of the French ambassador to the English court who was present throughout the years of their courtship and closely involved in the marriage negotiations was Sieur de la Mauvis Sierre. It was to his tune that the Duke often had to dance. But first, there is the Neapolitan prince. Aye, that's a cult indeed, for he does nothing but talk of his horse, and he makes it a great appropriation to his own good parts, 
that he can shoe him himself. I am much afeard my lady, his mother, played false with a smith. This is Don John, Philip II's bastard brother, whose naval base was in Naples, at that time part of the Spanish Habsburg Empire. The details are all almost deliciously true. He was famous for his horsemanship, his skill in taming unmanageable horses. And he was a bastard. His father, the Emperor Charles V, had had an affair with a certain Barbara Blomberg, a singer. And for entirely political reasons, briefly in 1575, it was Elizabeth who wooed him. How like you the young German, the Duke of Saxony's nephew. This is the Count Palatine, John Casimir, our ally in the Netherlands wars. He wrote a letter to Elizabeth in 1564, asking for her hand, but was rejected. Portia also rejects him. Very vilely in the morning when he is sober and most vilely in the afternoon when he is drunk. I pray thee, set a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket. I know he will choose it. Casimir was responsible for the creation of the largest wine barrel in the world at Heidelberg Castle, full naturally of Rhenish wine. Now back to the dream and to a running joke about beards. One of the embarrassing aspects of the French match was the fact that at 17, Duke Francis was less than half the Queen's age. This led his mother to inform the English ambassador, Sir Thomas Smith, delightedly. And now he begins to have a beard come forth. From one Francis to another, in the play, it is Francis Flute who exclaims, let me not play a woman, I have a beard coming. The reference becomes undeniable in the rehearsal scene when Bottom agrees to play the part of the lover, Pyramus. He asks Quince, what beard were I best to play it in? And proceeds to rifle through the rude mechanicals prop box. I will discharge it in either your straw colour beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple in grain beard, or your French crown colour beard, your perfect yellow. Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play barefaced. And I should point out that um, one of the Duke's envoys was called Jean de Coincé. So what on earth is all this about? Some, a French crown colour beard, your yellow, is a triple hit at Alençon and his lack of a beard. He was mocked as an imp of the crown of France and he loved money and yellow is the colour of the French crown, the gold AQ. He was himself perfect yellow, notorious for his failures and disgraces on the battlefield and a general swipe at the French, hairlessness could be a sign of syphilis. To the English, it was known as the French pox. But what of the other surreal coloured beards, the straw colour and the purple? It so happens that they fit with two of the Queen's most important suitors. In the early years of her reign, the Swedish and imperial representatives were courting at a most marvellous rate. This is according to Bishop John Jewell, Bishop of Salisbury, writing at the time. Straw colour matches the colouring of the blonde bearded King Eric of Sweden. And purple in grain accords with Archduke Charles of the Imperial House of Habsburg. Since Roman times, Purple had been the imperial colour. But who owns an orange tawny beard? This is a particularly teasing clue, since it could apply to any one of the three leading favourites of the Queen among her English courtiers in the 1570s and 80s. All three have a touch of ginger. Most famously and lastingly, the Queen's affections were bestowed on the Earl of Leicester. 
he was her sweet Robin. But in this context, in the dream, their relationship at the height of the French courtship turns sour. It is figured in the quarrel and estrangement between Oberon and Titania. Lester was madly jealous of Francis, reported as cursing the French. His favour with the Queen briefly eclipsed since he had secretly married Lettuce Knollis. Each accused the other of infidelity. These are the forgeries of jealousy. The Earl of Oxford decidedly ginger in colouring, but he was only in high favour in the 1570s. By the 80s, he was in deep disgrace. Like Oxford, Sir Christopher Hatton first attracted Elizabeth's attention through his dancing and his skill at the tilt. And there are two good reasons for him being the chosen target here. I discovered a direct reference to him sporting an orange tawny beard in this tale of Sir Christopher Hatton in London. It's a fantastical story involving time travel and cross-dressing. Will he not be amazed to see Sir Christopher Hatton in a white silk bodice instead of a wrought jerkin, a tall hat and a spruce orange tawny beard? But there is a true story to tell of Hatton's assiduous wooing of Elizabeth and his presumption in aspiring to be her lover. The story is lampooned in a third Shakespeare comedy, Twelfth Night. What particularly irked his fellow courtiers about Hatton was the contrast between his common origins and his spectacular rise to a string of the highest offices in the land, all gifted to him by the Queen. So he was not born great, and his rivals did not consider he achieved greatness but he certainly had greatness thrust upon him. A gentleman commoner who rose to become Lord Chancellor and Knight of the Garter. So here's my claim. All the defining tropes and code words associated with Hatton's rising at court, an elevation which seems to have aroused envy and mockery in equal measure, are worked into the fabric of this comedy and focused in the figure of Malvolio. Hatton was vice chamberlain of the Queen's household. Malvolio was steward of Olivia's household. Both aspired to enter their lady's chamber. Hatton's personal posy or motto, according to Gabriel Harvey, was Felix Infortunatus, or alternatively, Fortunatus in Felix. Um, hence the sign off to the fateful letter, the fortunate unhappy. In the dialogue you are about to hear, seemingly inconsequential banter between Sir Toby and Sir Andrew Egucheek, Shakespeare packs a punch with at least seven palpable hits at Hatton. But first, to show that Shakespeare was not alone in seeking to satirise Hatton's success at court. We have on record two entertainments, one dating from about 1580, penned by the Earl of Oxford, and one by Ben Jonson, dating from 1603. During the 1570s, there was quarrelling and bitter rivalry between Hatton and Oxford. Hence, this listing of a device now presumed lost. A pleasant conceit of Veer, Earl of Oxford, discontented at the rising of a mean gentleman in the English court, circa 1580. And Ben Jonson, on more than one occasion, hit at Hatton as a one trick wonder, attributing his elevation to his dancing feet. Homeby was his magnificent prodigy house in Northamptonshire and close to Althorpe House, the home of the Spencers. So Johnson's entertainment at Althorpe was performed before Queen Anne of Denmark and Prince Henry in 1603. The maskers dance before Anne. 
but none of these do hope to come by wealth to build another home be. All those dancing days are done. Men must now have more than one grace to build their fortunes on, else our souls would sure have gone all by this time to our feet. Now, back to Twelfth Night, Act One, Scene Three. And as you listen to the dialogue, note the following, and especially Shakespeare's brilliant pun on caper. As Vice Chamberlain, Hatton was responsible for organizing masks and revels. He was regarded as socially inferior by his rivals at court. He was the dancing chancellor who came into court by the galliard. Elizabeth's pet name for him was Mutton or Sheep. He fantasized about becoming the queen's lover. Mary, Queen of Scots, claimed he was. And in 1583, he commissioned the sieve portrait of his mistress. And in the top right hand corner, the cameo scene shows Hatton with his page and with members of the Queen's bodyguard, of which he was captain. Finally, his social elevation was entirely due to his legs. Ha ha. Here comes the dialogue. I am a fellow of the strangest mind in the world. I delight in masks and revels sometimes altogether. Art thou good at these kickshaws, knight? <laughs> As any man in Olivia, whatsoever he be, under the degree of my betters, and yet I will not compare with an old man. What, what is thy excellence in, in a galliard, knight? Faith, I, I, I can cut a caper. And I can cut the mutton to it. And I think I have the back trick simply as strong as any man in Olivia. Wherefore are these things hid? Wherefore have these gifts a curtain before them? Are they like to take dust, like Mistress Moore's picture? Why dost thou not go to church in a galliard and come home in a caranto? I did think by the excellent constitution of thy leg, it was formed under the star of a galliard. I tis strong, and it does in different well in a flame-coloured stock. Shall we set about some revels? What, what, what shall we do else? Were we not born under Taurus? Taurus? That's sides and heart. No, no, sir. It is legs and thighs. Let me see thee, caper. Ah, higher. Ah, ha, ha. Excellent. I think Shakespeare shows his genius in lighting upon the one word in the English language, caper, which could bring together the suggestion of dancing a galliard and also an accompaniment to mutton. So here is the evidence that Shakespeare was privy to court insider gossip and burlesqued it on the stage. Like Bottom, he can gleek upon occasion meaning he can make pointed jests about real situations. But while Dr. Samuel Johnson suspected this, I am always inclined to believe that Shakespeare has more allusions to particular facts and persons than his readers generally suppose. Perhaps in this enumeration of Portia's suitors, there may be some covert allusion to some of Elizabeth. But modern scholars, Blinkered by the limitations of the Stratford biography, are either incurious or in denial. Thus, Helen Hackett, author of a book length study, Shakespeare and Elizabeth, The Meeting of Two Myths, can observe in her introduction to A Midsummer Night's Dream curiously, Shakespeare's works hardly ever mention Elizabeth. While Professor Bate states boldly, it is absurd to suppose that any Elizabethan play might contain satiric references to particular aristocrats of the day. This, in my book, 
is scholarly dereliction. To persist in ignorance or denial is to miss half the meaning and half the fun. The author is with Puck in delighting in such mischief. And those things do best please me that befall preposterously. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, very, very interesting. Thank you. And thank you also to our actors who are getting lots of love in the chat, as indeed are you, Julia. Um, now, a question came in. It's not, I, I guess it's um, slightly tangential to your uh, uh, presentation, Julia, but let me ask it anyway. It's from Carol P. Do you agree with Ted Hughes that being a political outcast was vital to the author's artistic development? Yes, I, I mean, that's a, a, that's a huge question, isn't it? Um, and that sense that he, he moves between the interface of insider and outsider gives him the most astonishing breadth of experience, um, which is something that we all see in Shakespeare again and again. Um, so he can see it, see it from these two absolutely starkly opposed um, perspectives. Okay, now here's a, a fairly direct question. Um, do you think, this is from John Yeomans, do you think the dream is a story about Dudley's courtship of the Queen at Kenilworth, Midsummer 1575? Uh, well, I would move the date on to the summer of 1579. That's when uh, the Duke of Alençon comes on a visit to the Queen and excites the extreme jealousy of um, and sulkiness and well even worse actually uh, with Leicester. Leicester actually on three occasions tries to assassinate um, not the Duke of Alençon but his envoy uh, Jean Simier um, and the Queen actually calls him a murderous poltroon. So that is the drama behind the squaring between Oberon and Titania um, and there's quite detailed um, references in the play to specific um, instances that summer. Okay, thank you, Julia. Well, um, I'm sure after this, uh, you'll go and look in the chat and uh, in the Q&A, but particularly in the chat, and you'll see some really, really wonderful, positive comments for, um, for you there. Lots about the excellent research that you have just articulated. So thank you so much. Before we move on, uh, an earlier question came up and I, I, I actually, I wonder if I could ask this question to Mark. Uh, Mark, if you don't mind, um, a question came up, it said, um, are King Lear and Richard II examples of insiders who became outsiders? And this is the point, how do you portray this in performance? Well, I, I, William, I'm struck, and whoever asked me that question, I'm struck tonight by how how much the so many of the leading characters experience uh, the the old Elizabethan idea of melancholy or separation from the self. In fact, the whole the whole uh, tool of soliloquies to an audience um, implies a separation from yourself. You are standing as a questioner, questioning what you are doing how can you do that and remain as one person so definitely both Richard II and King Lear if you begin as an actor playing those parts you have to go through a place in the middle of the play where you are totally confused and don't know who you are before you hopefully refine yourself rather tragically just before you die Hamlet's the same and so you 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 should experience a, a exile uh, during the performance um, Sometimes I'll go to the plays and they're done very well, but no one's ever got confused. And so nothing much has happened. But I, I, I think these characters not only are exiled from the courts that they govern, but they're exiled from their sense of their own self, of who they are and have to uh, reconstitute themselves. And is that difficult to portray? I mean, you're, you're, you're attempting in a way to portray your own confusion to an audience who may be confused by your confusion. I think he I, I think he I think he writes it that way. I don't think you have to do anything but but play sincerely and honestly what he's written. Um, 
I would defy anyone to to rationally explain poor Tom's some of poor Tom's statements in King Lear. Um, but I think you have to you have to probably play it by setting up an expectation of what's going to happen in your life that isn't what the play is. And then you will be properly surprised when the play unfolds because you're expecting something different to happen. But it's all child's play, isn't it? It's all pretend. But yes, ideally, you should go through that experience in the safety of the theatrical environment. That's why people pay their money. They want to be with someone going through that kind of really upsetting uh, mental breakdown, uh, but know that it's not going to have consequences on that person. Um, that, that a good drink in the bar won't solve afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much for that, Mark. And once again, thank you, Julia, for uh, yeah, a really, really um, thought-provoking presentation. Superb research, as everyone in the chat is saying.